Welcome everyone, this is Mastering in Lib Curl Part 1. I am... Um, yes, so let's start this. I am, of course, Daniel Stenberg. I am the lead developer of the Curl project. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm available on the socials like in Mastodon, as you can see my account there. I work for Wolf SSL. We do curl support. Uh, that's uh, in case you want help or have anything related to curl that you and your business uh, want, want us to help you with. We are here today. Uh, or this mastering lib, lib curl setup is basically done like this. So it's a two part session. I'm going to do the part one today and the second part on November 20. That is on Monday if you're uh, doing this live. So it's going to be live. It is live streamed and you can see them both Zoom and on Twitch at the same time, whatever you want. And it's expected to last multiple hours. I, I'm hoping that I will go for about two hours apart. So four hours in total, maybe a little more. It, they are both going to be recorded. They are both going to be provided after the fact, of course, in case you miss any parts, want to go back or you know have to leave early. There are going to be lots of material you've never seen before. I haven't talked about them before. So there's a lot of new slides that I've done. So bear with me. I'm sure I've done uh, several mistakes, but uh, I'm sure we can get through that. And there will be a lot of source code on display in this slides here. So make sure that you can actually read text at least this size, maybe a little bit smaller as well when I get to them, because you know showing source code on, on the screen, you probably need to be at least decently sized. Otherwise, um, if you don't see the source code and you want to go, go back and see the code in detail, this URL here, the last line here, is a, is a dedicated Git repository. You can go and all the examples that I will show in both part one and, both, and, and part two, uh, they are available there in, in um, ready to compile versions. They actually con sometimes contain a few more lines that I will show on screen because uh, you know they include stuff and things like that. So make sure that they actually build them. And they should work. And that is a um, Git repository. So if you find errors, you can submit an issue or pull request or whatever. <clears throat> so if you want to base something on something I explain, go there and uh, copy, and pa copy and paste from, from those. A convenient thing. So, and again, ask questions if you have any, either just immediately in the chat or in the Q&A thing in, at Zoom. And I will try to get them uh, as I speak and explain to you today how things work. Since it's a pretty long thing, it might be a little bit too long to wait to the end for the questions because then we might have forgot what we actually were talking about, you know, a long time ago. So let's hit it. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about. So there, this is part one, November 16. That's today that I'm doing this recording. So I'm going to start about talk about the project remind everyone how it works, where we are, then how to get libcurl, stuff about the ABI and API, how the main architecture of the library, some fundamentals, how the API and the APIs work, setting up your connections uh, when you want to do a libcurl transfer. And that is basically where we are going to end. That's the intermission. And the next part, that's kind of amazing, right? We, those six bullets uh, are going to take a while to get through but there's a lot of material you'll see and then and then the next part that is going to be equally long possibly slightly longer than i'm going to talk about more about how controlling different aspects of the transfers that you set up how the share api works and is it designed how to, uh, a lot about tweaking things for tls how to do proxies and, and a lot of these are then dedicated to particular options that you can do set to control transfers f with these properties or um, functions and the header API, the URL API, very briefly about WebSocket because I've done this completely separate uh, session before. So if you want to learn about WebSocket API, you better go and, and see my dedicated WebSocket uh, stream instead. 
that's basically I think 45 minutes just WebSocket API discussion and a brief brief thing about the future of libcurl and where we might go next so that's the second part but the second part is of course not today so let's get into it this um this is the project we call curl right and it started out in the early 1996 actually in the late 1996 when some when a developer not me really released a project called HTTP get that I found started playing with submitted patches to I became the maintainer of and in August 1997 I had renamed it and I called it URL get because it could support more than HTTP by then it became curl in, nine, in March 1998 the command line to uh, well, the project and the command line tool and then actually in August 2000 we um, offered prevent, uh, pre presented published released libcurl the library so, and we have always released them together in the same tarball so you basically typically you build both the command line tool and the library at the same time but that journey started the libcurl journey started in August August 2000 when I just wanted to convert and, and provide the internet transfer capabilities of the command line tool to other applications other users who, who want who might want it built in to their applications right so that is how how we all started and curl of course the name it comes from c the c is not the language c as a lot of people would insist but it's for client i wanted it to be a short name it should be possible to type in a command line uh, because of the command line tool and i also appreciated that you could possibly think of it as a c a url or the contents of url uh, and afterwards we figured out fun things that you all oh, could have been curl url request library or just capable ubiquitous reliable libre but mm, it's it's just a name this is the project the tool and really the main products we have in this uh, in this project of course the project is called curl the uh, one of the main products is the command line tool that we call curl and we call the library libcurl sometimes and i'm guilty of this myself i also refer to the library as curl so maybe sometimes curl is the project the tool or the library or all of them or sort of a few of them and it's it's uh, you know it's curl curl the library and the command line tool is always and only client-side transfers never a server implementation we pretty much draw the line there and it's always transfer related upload download or both and it's uh, associated with an endpoint that is a url either you upload to a url you up or you download from a url it is completely and has always been open source everything in curl is open source and everything is done in the open so we're we try to do everything as transparently and as open and available as possible so everyone can join in and participate wherever and whenever you want and you can reshare and change anything the curl license is what i call essentially mit license because it's slightly modified but it's slightly modified in a way that shouldn't actually affect anyone so it's i actually call it mit licensed all the time even though it's strictly speaking not exactly this is the curl license all the language is should be familiar to anyone who's read an mit or bsd style license because it's basically the same in the curl project everything is developed uh, what i call by everyone because everyone can provide code participate and, and help out to uh, to your uh, you know abilities and uh, what you want and needs and and so on um, I'm the only one who's involved in this that I know of that who works on this full time. Uh, but and to, to participate and to provide anything, you just have to um, submit a pull request. You don't need to do any kind of agreements or sign papers or anything. You can just get there, submit it, and we will review, provide feedback, and and then we will make sure that it is good enough before we merge it. <clears throat> and of course it's thoroughly tested and you know proven before we watch as well and there's a small team of maintainers other than me that can accept the merge changes i think we're actually around maybe 15 20 people who have the powers to do it so it could be a set of other people beside me and that team of people is of course also 
sort of changing gradually over time. People are coming and, and going yeah, to as usual and, and to be expected. So we do releases every eight weeks. Typically, that's what we aim for. Sometimes we do them sooner when we have a nasty bug that we want to make sure that people don't have to suffer from longer than necessary and then we do them earlier. But <laughs> the plan is always to stick to the eight week release schedule on Wednesdays, eight weeks, Wednesdays. Um, so we're right now at 252 releases since that very first HTTP GET release that I didn't do, uh, counting all until today then. Um, and we, we, we are, so the releases are always time-based, right? So we release what is in the master branch at the time of the release. So we, we don't do many very crazy separate development branches. So we stick to the master branch. We make sure that the master branch is always working and it should work. And, and by the time the release date is here, we just ship what's there. Well, we tag it and so on, but that's how we work. And we have this eight week release cycle. So pretty much it starts here on the right side, which is the release Wednesday. And then we go down, we have a 10 day cooldown period after release. If, if nothing serious was reported during those 10 days, we open the feature window and we have a green feature window for 21 days. That's three weeks up and we're coming up to that Saturday up when the green turns red. Um, and then we switch off the feature a window and we go into a feature freeze instead and we have a 25 days feature freeze during which we only allow bug fixes to get merged and no features or changes or what we call so and then after that 25 day feature freeze we have a release wednesday again so on and on and on so this is the eternal 56 day eight week release cycle that we stick to unless we have to do an early release and one of our fundamental cornerstones in the project is, of course, that we never break existing functionality. Things that we have implemented and shipped, we stick to that. We we hold on to our promises. So, whatever we ship, you've started to use it. You can, you should be able to rely on the fact that we will not break it, not willingly at least. So sometimes, of course, we have bugs, but then we fix the bugs and we ship again. We do everything on GitHub, pretty much. You know, we have we you submit your problems as issues, you propose changes as pull requests. As you know, the, these days are more or less a, a classic GitHub um, development model. This is the GitHub URL. You can go to GitHub.com/curl/curl curl project the curl uh, the curl repository in the curl project. If you want to. If you want to read up on more things on how to learn this, if you don't want to listen to me blab about it, you can go and we have man pages for everything. We have a, everything, uh, all the man pages and all the documentation is also provided online on this web site, right? curl.se slash libcurl for all the library stuff. The book, everything curl, uh, the image here is uh, the cover. It also contains a lot of descriptions and, and um, tutorial stuff about how to uh, program with libcurl. If uh, you don't find the answers to your problems, your questions, you can ask for help and we have a mailing list uh, that is active and you can go there if you have any library development using debugging, blah, blah, whatever. And it, so it's related to libcurl. You, it's the curl library mailing list. You go to this URL to subscribe and uh, then fire off. And you can, of course, you know, ask about anything that is related to curl and curl development, curl, libcurl use, curl use protocols, uh, things like that. And if you prefer to not use a mailing list, you can go to the to the sort of web thing, the web discussion thing on GitHub on this URL. It's in. If you go to the curl repository and there's a dis uh, discussion link at the top, you can go there and ask questions or uh, similar things and if you're if you want to pay for help if you're a commercial entity you want to uh, get some professionals to help you out really soon maybe this afternoon you get in touch with us at Wolf SSL uh, and we can help you immediately so anyway curl supports a lot of stuff you know uh, the amount of features is actually kind of uh, astounding and uh, mind-boggling but um, um, yes, but in spite of that, 
or in, maybe in spite, but in addition to that, it also runs on pretty much everything. So whatever you use today or tomorrow, you used last year and or you're going to transition to in the future, you can be fairly sure and certain that uh, curl and libcurl will run on whatever you throw at it. And I actually recently did an update to my collection of operating systems that curl has been proven to run on and we are now at 101 operating systems um, that people have reported has been able to run curl or libcurl or both. So uh, it's an amazing number of operating systems. Of course, most people cannot even, you know, mention more than a s very small subset of these operating systems. I know I certainly can't, uh, but it's uh, it's a hobby of mine to collect these um, operating systems anyway. <clears throat> so it's um, the this is of course done by a lot of people. So we recently. Uh, cross the line there as you can see on the right side here the number of commit authors uh, surpassed 1200 recently i think we're 1217 or something right now most people of course that's the the, the green line here have are uh, single committers only roughly 60 something percent of all the committers only committed once but that's fine uh, an improvement is an improvement so anyway as you can see a lot of people are providing code and a lot of people, many more, are helping out in different ways. Uh, you know, submitting bug reports, uh, helping out with the infrastructure, just advising on how to do things or providing good ideas and, and things like that. So, and we keep track of everyone uh, who's helping out and we were saying thanks and we give them credit for whatever they do. And that list of contributors have recently surpassed 3000. And people, when I show this graph, uh, it's inevitable that you're uh, that people are asking about that bump in the year two thousand two thousand five, <laughs> because why why is that that's a break in in the graph there? But and the the boring fact is uh, that um, just because at that year I went back and added all the names who had ever helped out, so sort of corrected past mistakes. So it should have been it shouldn't have been a bump. It should have been higher gradually before that but hey i i am um, I, I do my best and the number of lines of code in the project has been gradually increasing of course ever since the beginning we are at around 160,000 lines of code right now in everything in total if we include comments excluding blank lines actually um so you can see that we are constantly adding a lot of code <laughs> and it's a strangely linear growth as well right uh, anyway that means that we are today counting at somewhere around 20 billion installations and it's an open source project people are installing this without telling us and they we certainly don't know in how many units uh, everyone's installs are actually running so this is a very rough guesstimate maybe it's 10 maybe it's 40 uh, who knows and it's also of course constantly changing so it's impossible for us to actually have a very detailed number and of course all these users or all these installations they are using it <coughs> in this way so all of these different devices here around the cloud you know f uh, games fridges loudspeakers cars tvs cameras printers kitchen devices phones tablets you know video doorbells and game devices watches medical devices all of these things are talking to other things on the on the internet right most of them are connecting to a server somewhere they want to do some download upload do stuff figure things out and today they all often uh, go to using curl for that right so all of these use curl as the little component, libcurl as the little component to communicate with their particular servers and to do their transfers. So when you want to work with libcurl, you of course have to first get it, right? And you, in most cases, you just install it. So if you're running a Linux distribution or you use a BSD or even if you run 
like things on a Mac, Homebrew or Mac ports, things like that. Or on Windows, you can use this VC package, chocolate chocolately complicated name to pronounce, or or Conan, three different ways that are sort of sort of a packet manager on Windows managers. <laughs> or I mean, of course, every system has a lot of different alternatives and options, but I wanted to just say that there are options for all of them. And at this screen, I'm just showing you a, a set of different ways how you get libcurl installed on your system. Um, like different Linux distros, different BSDs, different uh, Mac uh, approaches and different win Windows approaches. All of these different things here, just showing different command lines here, how you install these pa those packages to get libcurl, the libcurl development package installed on your system because you want the libcurl development package installed so that you can develop your stuff using it. Or, I mean, uh, of course, a perfectly fine option is also to just build it yourself. And then you have a few different ways to build it yourself as well, because why have one way when you can have many different ways? Uh, <clears throat> so one, the classic way is, of course, if you're using Linux or a Unix C thing, you can do it with configure or CMake, just the classic styles, how you use them normally. Or if you're using Windows, you can do uh, build with the uh, Microsoft Visual Studio thing. And if you do build curl, libcurl yourself, you also want to use third-party uh, uh, third libraries really to support stuff uh, uh, that curl needs. And when you do that, you want to make sure that you install the development versions of these uh, third-party libraries so that you can get that stuff working properly when you build libcurl. And Here's our two, uh, I'm just showing you here how to run configure and this co uh, particular configure line then shows how to enable it with the OpenSSL. And you just make and then make install and with CMake you do a similar thing. Actually the CMake line that probably needs to say that it needs OpenSSL as well, I forgot about it. But that's that's the way you do it. And, and of course, if you wanna do it Windows style, you can either build uh, with the, uh, and make, which is wrong, it's a typo there on the slide. Uh, so you can build from the command line uh, with the, the Visual Studio, or you can build with the Visual uh, Studio project files that we ship uh, in all curl releases. We actually generate those kind of project files so you can uh, load it in your IDE and build from within Visual Studio if you want to. And similarly, you can build curl pretty much on all systems like this. These are just the convenient provided ways, but building it in other ways is also possible. When you build libcurl yourself, instead of installing it from somewhere, you have the opportunity and option to customize it, right? Then you can enable, disable particular features, protocols, and, and select third-party options. If um, And then if you do that, you should just remember that the, the libcurl API, it's the same thing, right? It's always the same, but depending on what you enable disable in your build, they may then return differently, right? If you disable a certain protocol, then trying to use that protocol will of course return an error because you disabled it. Um, and of course, this is a very popular way. If you, all those, I showed you those images of different things that are using libcurl, they are typically built libcurl themselves so you could remove things you won't use or use the particular third-party libraries that you like to use so that you have a you control the environment you control better exactly what you ship in your stuff and when you use third-party dependencies and you really want to do that in curl because with libcurl it only it doesn't uh, implement all the details itself but relies on other quality third-party libraries to do certain parts that are necessary to do to perform a network transfer. For example, TLS. If you want to do HTTPS transfers, you need TLS, but curl itself doesn't implement TLS. It uses a third-party library. TLS, SSH, LDAP, RTMP, or a, a compression thing with HTTP, even, and even just the binary HTTP2 uh, level transfers and, and HTTP3, including the quick part. And 
even if you want to do asynchronous name resolving without threads like using C Ares instead or several auth options you need a third-party library that helps curl in use them typically when you install from somewhere and you just install libcurl dev someone has built that libcurl for you with a particular set of third-party dependencies and, and then you just get all of them automatically without you having to think about it and to the requirements on, on libcurl they are not very high or, or complicated pretty much when you build libcurl it it of course gets a, uh, it ends up with a certain size right after link and bam you get a library and the most minimal libcurl build with the smallest tls it's around 100k on disk I, I say 100k it depends on what architecture as well of course but on a 32-bit you're, you're it's around 100k if you have a really stripped down tls as well so that's the sort of the lowest possible end pretty much um, and the lowest possible memory requirements for libcurl itself is around 20 kilobytes it's a very limited you usually spend more than that and i should also add that even if i say 20 kilobytes that's for, for libcurl itself usually the tls part also uses actually more usually more than that uh, to to be able to function properly so um, yes that's what i mentioned it adds more memory requirements for the tls library but what is is important to remember then of course is that if you're even if you build the most stripped down libcurl it still has the same api of course most features if you have if you go with the smallest one you have disabled a lot of features so a lot of um, function calls will return not implemented but you can still link it with it and so on <clears throat> so you have installed it or built it then you have to use it right so libcurl provi provides an abi and an a b api and an abi so first i wanted to just mention that it is the same api on all platforms which means that if you're writing a, an application that is using libcurl the lib the libcurl using part can be the same on whatever platform you don't so it's also easy for you to move to make your application portable as long as you're using libcurl because libcurl could work as that portability layer and you can always upgrade to the next version of libcurl without breakage that's sort of that's the promise we have so that's that's what i alluded to earlier also and i will probably repeat this that we don't break existing behavior it's compatible but you may not be able to downgrade right if you start implementing features that were <laughs> introduced in this version you can't go back to the previous version because of course that version didn't have the feature it has now <clears throat> And that's also one of the reasons why, why all the options and functions are clearly documented sort of when in which curl libcurl version they were introduced. So you know, blah, blah, blah was introduced in version this. So you know that that's the lowest possible version that you can use for, for using that particular feature. And we have done a lot of versions, right? The first libcurl version shipped in August 2000 called 7.1. And the most recent one, at the time of this recording is 8.4.0 we released it on october 11 2023 uh, a little over 23 years later uh, we have bumped the major version number once uh, but yes there are basically 200 releases in between those those different ones they all differ in features i mean protocol support in performance in behavior sometimes i mean not behavior as in the abi behavior but in behavior over the network because sometimes we have figured out and adapted things to work better smoother more compatible or uh, sort of stuff like that and of course more later versions newer versions have more functions we add functions over time i showed you the number of lines of code part of that is because we add features not only because we add features but we also pretty much just improve code right make it more tolerant work better more secure and stuff like that the libcurl api we work with is for c and that's what i'm going to talk to you about today and i'm going to show you numerous examples later and they're all going to be written in c 
And of course, you can use it for C++ as well, because C++ is basically C with the, with the cherry on top. But, but, but um, that's more of a coincidence. We are sticking to C. And, and what's a, a good part, um, most bindings that are provided by people uh, for other languages, and there are many, I, I think we count more than 60 bindings these days that people have written to offer libcurl powers to other languages. Most of those bindings are rather shallow and thin or thin layers between libcurl and that language, and they often provide more or less the same kind of API. So by and you can often, by and reading and understanding the C API, you can often use that knowledge and just translate it over to your other language without too much trouble. So I will speak C today and I will show you a lot of examples and I will, uh, all examples that I show also have names, which is good for you if you go back to that Git repository and you want to check out the example after the fact, just remember the name of the example and you can find it there. Uh, yes, and what is, in, what is sort of, we have gotten around to, we didn't really start out like this, but whatever you do when you use libcurl in your application, you just need one header file, and it's called curl slash curl dot h. This is the only include file you need to get uh, all the curl stuff you want in your program. Of course, you might want to need other include files for other purposes, but for, for curl stuff, you just need this header. Easy peasy. Uh, in most of my examples, I have actually just not included the, uh, the include file, so you won't see the include file that often. But but in the examples that uh, in the Git repository, they have includes. And when when you done, you have started to write your application. You want to link with your libcurl library. It's easy. If you run it with a typical GCC or Clang, you just build your code, link with libcurl. Usually when you have installed it with your Linux distro or something, they have installed the libcurl in, in a default place. So you just, you don't have to tell anyone where it is. It's in a system default library uh, directory. So these are, are perfectly fine ways to just build your libcurl using source code. But uh, as long as you build with whatever you build with, just somewhere you tell your compiler where are the curl header files and where is the libcurl library uh, and how to link with that and then you can build with whatever c compiler you want um, <clears throat> it's not very complicated um, as if you've never done c programming before it might be a little bit of a uphill battle but if you just get it, learn your C basic stuff and then you will learn how to link with other libraries and then you will link with curl just as well as any other library. It's, it's not more complicated than that. And when it comes to documentation, we document a lot of things in detail for everything. So every function and every option has man pages, their own dedicated man pages. So we have I think we are up to almost 500 individual man pages. We have more than 120 standalone examples in the Git repository for curl. I mean, excluding all the examples that I will show today. Some of them are pretty similar, of course. <clears throat> and if you go to the website at curl.se, the website always have it always has all the uh, man pages the latest version of them always rendered online and it always has the latest versions and the latest collection of all the standalone examples as well so if you go there you can find the latest editions of all of them um, and of course again i mentioned it already everything curl the book it provides even more resources it will go into describing things sometimes a little bit different from and more of a tutorial style than maybe the man pages do and what is good here is that it is actually pretty easy. So if you just have a function name or an option name with libcurl and you're thinking, how do I use this? Just Google it. I'm sure um, our documentation is usually the top link or at least one of the f in, in one of the top results. So it's easy to find the documentation for whatever option and function you want to use. So <coughs> getting into this, 
and um, I hope you're getting uh, warmed up so <clears throat> I'm actually already half through and we're only 35 minutes in so I'm, I'm going to uh, be able to spend some time to explain all of this to you. So the libcurl architecture, um, th this might sound complicated, but I'm, I'm just going to be brief and talk to you a little bit about some general design ideas we have in the project. This, I'm not going to explain exactly how everything works because that would be unnecessary. So I wanted to go back to this thing that the fact that that the API, the curl API, libcurl API is for C, right? And we have written everything in libcurl in the language C and the flavor is called C89, sometimes C90. But, uh, and I just wanted to emphasize that we do this. We still have everything written in C89 in libcurl. And we, when we started this journey, there really was no other alternative that had a, <laughs> that was a serious option. So, we started with it because that was the sensible option and maybe now there are alternatives and i'm saying maybe because i'm still not convinced that there are actually quality alternatives to write system level libraries for uh, a wide variety of operating systems but let's say there is but we started this and we've been doing this for quite a while now so the fact that it is written in C makes it extremely portable, right? The explanation that it, I mean, the fact that it runs on 101 operating systems, at least, I mean, that is uh, to a great deal explained by the fact that it is written in C. So yes, it is not a memory safe language. We might get a certain amount of problems because of this that we could have solved by using another language, but by sticking to C, we also have this extreme portability and existing everywhere sort of chance. So the plan is to maybe over time allow different portions and, and pieces of curl to be written in other languages and we can sort of select to use that at build time. But I'm also convinced and I'm going to sort of stick to the to this that the C code version of all those alternatives will also remain a build option to to remain this portable as you know run everywhere option. libcurl is a um, core um, yeah it is sort of built up around a core with a lot of different backends for 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 different protocol options and I'll, and that's what I'm going to show you. So basically, w there's this yellow application that uses a public API to get into curl, right? That's the public API has, I think, around 90 different function calls you can use to do transfers. And you have a public API and that API has a different, it's a defined way to work. You know, you can read the documentation. It works the same way. You can upgrade curl. It works the same. But to power libcurl itself, for example, uh, to do different protocol e things uh, it has a large set of internal apis you won't see them from the outside but they exist in the inside and if when carl are using them they can themselves get powered by a number of different backends for example if you want to do content encoding which is pretty much a, a fancy way to do http compression uh, different compressions like uh, this set of uh, examples here in the little box Zlib, Brotly, Z standard. Three different ways to do HTTP compression. So if you want to support, you want to do transfers with one of those uh, compression methods, you have to support, uh, curl has to be built to support one of those libraries. And then, so we have a backend for different co content and coding, codings basically. And you can have zero, one or two or three uh, of them supported in your build. Uh, so basically you select that set at build time. And if you wanted, for example, every time you want to do transfer using a host name, you want your curl to resolve that host name into an IP address. And to do that, you want, you need to have curl, you, you, when you build curl, you tell curl which kind of resolver solution you want it to use. You can use a synchronous resolver, the threaded resolver or the CARIS resolver. So there are, you have to pick one out of those three and you have to use one because otherwise it won't work. Um, but of course, again, from the outside, from the application, uh, the yellow cloud here, it doesn't know. 
and it doesn't have to know it doesn't have to care well sometimes it needs to care but the idea here is that it's transparently not shown to the outside world if you want to do international domain names right idn you can select to build, build curl with one of the two different idn uh, libraries that we support either libidn2 or the win idn which is the windows native one or and you know you get the picture here if you want to build curl to support ssh which in curl means scp or sftp transfers you want to build curl to uh, and use one of these different SSH libraries, the libssh, libssh2, or wolfssh. So therefore, when you, from your application point of view, when you want to do an SFTP transfer, uh, your application doesn't know, but curl then could use uh, different backends to, to do that particular transfer. And the same goes for HTTP. If you want to do HTTP2, for example, you could go with the built-in nghttp 2 solution or use hyper if you want to go with http3 you have three different solutions to go from and if you if you're then using tls like in https or some other tls based protocol you know imaps or pop3s or yeah ftps a lot of there are a lot of tls transfer um, protocols and if you go there you have 12 different the uh, backends to to pick and choose from when you build curl so all of this and just saying you that sort of curl is that core with a lot of different backends that could be different and that are selected at build time <clears throat> it uh, usually it's totally uh, you know opaque you don't have to care about it it's supposed to not interfere with you but sometimes uh, they will and then it's good for you to know that this is actually how it actually works uh, under the hood and another thing is that everything in curl is non-blocking and i say everything with a little asterisk because there are a few rare exceptions but we don't talk about the exceptions here everything is non-blocking so it means that it can do parallel name results you know a lot of name resolving at the same time it can do a lot of parallel connection establishments at the same time it can do a lot of parallel tls handshakes at the same time and of course it can do parallel transfers uh, all of this with different latencies different bandwidth to different hosts over different connections you know near a server near you a server very remote from you and all of this it does in a single thread so when you use libcurl everything is in the single thread it's never another thread so you don't have to care about other threads uh, you really shouldn't care about other threads when you talk about curl um, the api works in this thread it won't start another thread well it might start another thread in the background but you won't need to care about it but because you will interfere with it in a single thread i will get back to uh, threading i think in part two we, and, and talk about it a little bit more so that's a little bit of the, of the design ideas the architecture stuff so now let's get started with the api things so finally 40 minutes in we're going to talk about how to actually interfere with libcurl i want to just say a few things to remember when talking about libcurl that will repeatedly come up and you know the f f I, I, I view it as a sort of the, the the three sides of the pyramid of libcurl maybe or maybe it was just an effort for me to make everything anything to fit the pattern of a pyramid so it's that all handles there are a lot of handles and i talk about I'll, I'll, I'll detail a lot of handles they're all opaque that which means that you cannot access any they're just pointers into something and then you need functions to use something out of those handles but but i we have a standard approach to handles and you will see, you will recognize that soon we always talk about urls as an uh, endpoint to transfers urls without a url uh, you can't do any transfer with curl it's sort of it's very it's the only mandatory option when doing a transfer you need a url and it's very callback focused so data is usually provided and um, provided to you and you provide data with uh, callbacks and not only data a lot of different activities and, and actions are 
are callback based and so and I will talk about a bunch of the callbacks um, maybe not too many today but in part two there will be more but it's fun we'll, we'll get to s at least some basic callbacks uh, very soon so libcurl internet transfers so let's do a transfer libcurl does basic transfers by default this is a sort of a primary setup for libcurl it is basic by default so if you want to do a libcurl transfer you can uh, just know that it won't be very fancy by default it will be do the bare minimum right you don't add, so when we add things usually they are opt-in options so if you want to do more fancy things you have to switch it on right enable all the bells without any enabling it'll be just no bells and the API is also largely protocol agnostic that means that you're usually just talking about a URL and without an application as you write it you don't have to know a lot about protocols or understanding a lot about protocol implementation or details or even networking usually just give libcurl a URL and it'll do the transfers with it you change behavior from that basic one by setting options so and you will see and you will that's I'm going to talk a lot about options so options is really what it's driving libcurl and to get started with a application that is going to use libcurl you need to do a global init uh, that's what you should do for several reasons but there are basically a chance for libcurl to set things up that are meant to be set up just once and never again until you're completely done and you're about to die um, so you have the complete reverse too so you have an init and you have a cleanup it works like this ba -ba, the first source code global.c and here i've just decided to i grade out the, the non-important parts because it's a global init first it just says global default and there's a global cleanup curl global cleanup in the end so when in it do whatever you want to do with libcurl and there's a global cleanup in the past it has been more important than before because it, in the past we also we different depending on what kind of operating system you're on and so on we might need to init tls libraries or socket things or things like that before libcurl can be used and if you don't call global init yourself libcurl will also, will actually do it behind your back and sort of second guess what you want to do so it might still work without global init and global cleanup or usually it actually works but we encourage you to use a dedicated and, and explicit init and cleanup to make it clear and avoid mistakes just because maybe libcurl didn't guess it correctly otherwise so what you want to do a transfer well, obviously you want to do a lib, uh, an internet transfer because that's why you're using libcurl so you want to do a transfer because it's transfer oriented we do transfers and then you set up an easy handle we call it an easy handle curl asterisk handle that's a pointer to a curl handle we also call, often call it easy handle because it's the easy interface i actually d called it easy interface as it was it was the first api i designed for libcurl and i wanted it to be easy so uh, uh, let's call it easy and I wanted to have the more complicated later and then they were not the, the more complicated one is not called complicated or difficult or hard but uh, anyway this is the easy interface so and the, this as again I mentioned previously this is an opaque uh, handle uh, it's just a handle just like a file pointer uh, when you do a regular C program you know when you open a file you can get that file pointer back it's just a pointer it's a handle to something and a curl handle like this an easy handle is just a handle to an internet transfer or potential internet transfer and it's a single one even if it, this single one can be done over and over but it's it's a thing as one handle to one transfer and we encourage users to reuse this handle to do more than one transfer because it also has a lot of caching and saving things so if you reuse it it might actually do the second transfer faster than it did the first transfer and you get a, an, such a handle with this curl easy init init and in an easy handle and return it 
bam. And then when you're done with that easy handle, when you want to shut up, uh, shut it down, close it, free all the resources, you call curl easy cleanup. And you will see this pattern in, in more occasions soon, the init and the cleanup. So the init one returns a handle, the cleanup one kills the handle. Uh, so pretty much like this. First, you do an ease in it, you get the handle back and grayed out here, you can see that it's actually using that handle. But when you're done using the handle, you clean up the handle and voila, you're done. <coughs> that little part in between the easy and the cleanup is of course what is actually, that's actually the performing something, right? Doing the transfer. And to do a transfer, you have to set a few options. I already said that you need to set a URL at least, right? So you create a handle and then you set a lot of options telling libcurl what to do. You want to do a transfer, but what kind of transfer? What do you want the transfer to do? How to do it? So the, tra the options you set are sticky. And with that, I mean that once you've set it, it will remain set in the handle, right? If you set, uh, you set verbose, enable verbose, it'll be there until you change it again. Even if you reuse the handle, it will remain set. And if you set a, a more than, you can set different options. There are many options. I will come back to that as well, but they are independent typically. So you, you can decide to set uh, a few options on, a few options off, or on, off, on, off, on, off, or blah, blah, blah. They're usually completely independent. So if, the, you know, a lot of options and they're all independent. So you can imagine that the amount of combinations are really uh, crazy. And uh, they're also then order independent. So it doesn't matter if you first set the verbose and then the URL or the URL first and then verbose or when you add a number of options, it doesn't matter in which order you set them because they're independent. So you just set them. Make sure that you set the options you want to set in whatever order you think is fine. And if you set strings, they copy the data. So if you set a URL, the libcurl will copy that URL into its own memory. So you, can, you don't have to keep the memory around after you have passed it on to curl. <clears throat> ah, and as I said, the only mandatory option, that the only thing that you have to set for a transfer is the URL. Because otherwise, if it doesn't have a URL, it doesn't know how to do the transfer, right? The, the, the URL is the end point in the other end. It needs, to, it, it needs the other end. The, 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 the local end is you here when you're running the application. The other end is the identified by the URL. And if you don't set any other option, download is the default action. So it will try to download that URL if you just set the URL. A typical application will set many options, possibly, you know, five, possibly 25, but there are a humongous amount of options. So you can, you can control, change, set, pretty much anything related to this transfer. As I mentioned here, timeouts, resolve things, connectivity details, protocol versions, TLS details and versions, authentication, a lot of that. Proxies opens up a whole slew of new options and then decide exactly how to retrieve and send the data and how to behave in different kind of situations that might appear. So depending on your needs, your, you might uh, get a lot of options to set, or maybe you're, you don't have a lot of needs, then you might get around with just setting a few. But I just wanted to throw this at you. So yes, over 300 options uh, are available to set. Um, they're all also in a flat uh, hierarchy. So there's no, you know, there's no tree or anything. It's just a long list, 300 names uh, that affects different parts of the transfer. Uh, but of course, so basically, if you want to do something, you need to search the documentation or figure out exactly what option to use or if there's an option for to use for that particular thing. And you set options with this fine function called curl easy setup. It sets an option in an easy handle, curl easy setup. It works like this. There's the first uh, argument, it returns a curl code. The first argument to the function is the handle that you want to change or 
set an option, set an option for. The second uh, argument is um, the option, and that is a curl opt underscore blah 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 name. And then it's uh, the third option is the parameter for that option. There, they are always three arguments, but the third argument here could be a different type of argument depending on the option. And that is a little bit of a complication. And if there ever is something I may regret when I decided this API is this choice, but too late, we're, uh, we're on already on this journey now. So it does this by doing this C thing called var args, which pretty much means that the compiler cannot really check the type of that third argument. So you need to make sure that you provide the right type of the, in the third argument because the compiler might not tell you when you're doing it wrong. You might then get a runtime crash instead, which is really boring. You might want extra type costs there so they make sure that you provide that argument with the correct type so that libcurl understands the option that you provide. And again, when you set string strings, libcurl will copy the data and it will return an error code of course if it couldn't if something failed set this option did it work did it not work um, it works like this so I sort of again here this particular little example here it sets first the first setup is the URL HTTPS colon slash slash curl dot se slash and um, it is uh, then setting the verbose mode <coughs> to one. And it, so see here, it uses one capital L. That means that it forces this to be a long type. Um, I will get to uh, I got a question about if uh, if there's anything if there's a blocking call using curl and how to determine the error. But uh, I will get into uh, blocking calls and how to do the transfers using blocking calls and and not blocking calls. So uh, hang on for that. There's also a question about caching, but I will I will get back to a lot of caching too, um, and about doing things or speed, sort of using sort of transfer performance and doing things faster with curl I will get back to that as well because I that's a common thing to ask about so um, just hang on and I will get to it where where am I so so like that you create the handle you set a bunch of options the URL one and a few other ones and then you do the transfer and here the curl is a perform. It performs the transfer using the easy handle. And curl is a perform is for synchronous transfers. It's a blocking call. I told you before that everything is non-blocking, but that's not. It's yes, it's non-blocking internally. But this is an API that is an, a blocking call. It will do the entire transfer and then return. So possibly you know if the transfer is really slow or is really big file and the server is really slow, it could be hours right before it returns or it could be milliseconds uh, depending on which kind of transfer you do and to which server and which protocol and so on so it provide it performs the entire transfer to the end and to the end here is either it's successful or until it fails and and then it returns and the failure here is of course also sort of reaching a timeout if you set a timeout so you know try to do it within this many seconds and until uh, if it doesn't complete within that amount of time it will return a failure and say hey i timed out but normally of course curly is a perform will do the transfer as fast as it just possibly can which means it, there's no there's no artificial waiting anywhere or, or slowing down or throttling anything by default it will just you know run as fast as it can typically when you do a network transfer though it's often the network itself that is the sort of bottleneck or the network interface or something the connection to the other side it's very rarely that libcurl itself is the blocking or the limitation here unless you you know download something from yourself or whatever but it's that's a more of a rare setup so it might take a very long time short time medium time it's hard to say you can limit how long time you you want it, you want to allow it to spend 
before it fails. And it returns an error code. And if it's zero, it's OK. If it's a non-zero value, it's an error. And there's a lot of cached info that is stored in the easy handle. So in the easy handle, when you do a transfer, it not only does the transfer it, but it also stores a lot of meta information about the transfer. And it also has caches yeah, related to the transfer. That's all the, the caching. I will get back to the caching. Forget about it for, for just now. So the, I just wanted then to go back and highlight the example here. This is how it does the curl easy perform, right? Create the easy handle, set options. And in this case, in this example here, only one option, just the URL and it's a download by default. Bam, curl easy perform. It will download the, the contents of that URL by default. And since we don't have any other options set, this will just throw out the output on standard out, which admittedly is not usually what you want your application to do. So yeah, this is a bit simplified. Maybe you don't want this, uh, your, your application to be this simple. But still, that's how, how you do it. And once you've done your transfer, maybe you do another transfer reusing the same ESA handle or another, another. You can do any amount of transfers reusing the same handle. You just set the new URL and you can go. But when you're done with it, you kill it and you kill it with curl easy cleanup. And it kills the handle and it frees up all the resources that are associated with the handle. You know, caches, data, blah, blah, whatever you have internally. Gone. And of course, then there's no memory leak or anything. But you might also just want to do curl easy reset. The curl easy reset function is a way to just clear all the settings back to factory default and then I can set my options again and then do another transfer maybe. So the, the curl easy reset is just a way to avoid having to close it and create a new one if you just want to have it fresh because it will let you, it will allow all the caching <clears throat> to survive which is a performance boost for you. That's that's really why you want to reuse handles because we have a lot of caches internally. So if you reuse the handle, it'll run faster. The subsequent transfers will run faster. And I'm, I mentioned it already, everything, not everything, a lot of things in curl is provided or offered with, with and using callbacks. And callbacks, as you know, is just a function pointer that you hand over to curl and curl will call that function at particular moments in time. And all the callback um, options in curl, they are called something that ends with the name function. And for all callbacks, there's a, a corresponding option called something ending with data. So for example, there's, there's an option called curl opt write function. That's the write callback. It has a corresponding pointer called curl opt write data. And the data thing is just a pointer that you can set to whatever you want because it's your pointer, but that pointer will be passed on to the callback. So it's a way for you to pass data from your application into the callback for whatever you want to do. For example, you want to pass in some local data from your, your function into the callback that libcurl will call. I will show you, uh, of course, in examples coming up. And and then the callbacks will be called by libcurl when those things are needed that the callbacks are there for, if they are needed. Uh, but here's a little caveat here, an important thing. Do not call libcurl itself back again from within callbacks. So if libcurl calls a callback, then, you know, then you're already within libcurl. So then don't call libcurl again back into libcurl again from within libcurl it, it's usually it doesn't work it will recall uh, return an error code there are some documented exceptions and uh, you will know about it when you've read about the exceptions so here's the example uh, you want for example you do a transfer, you have a write callback, and this is from the eyes of libcurl. When libcurl gets data from the remote, you know, download from curl.se, it gets data, it wants to store it somewhere. Um, so what does it do? It calls the write callback every time it gets data, tells the application, write this data somewhere, take care of it, 
I don't care how uh, you decide. So data is then provided to the application using this callback. And you set the callback with this. I mentioned it already, curl opt write function. Cur libcurl then wants to write data. And pretty much it means that it got data it wants to store. It, uh, it, it could be a small amount, it could be a large amount. And this is the um, prototype for the callback. It's based on the fwrite function. That's why it looks like this. So it's a pointer to data, and this it actually has a size and the n memb, just because <laughs> in my uh, I'm not sure I should call it wisdom, but uh, I anyway I when I decided on this a, this uh, prototype back in um, the early 2000s, I decided it should look like and work like the fwrite function, and the fwrite function actually works like this. So the total size that is coming is actually a size multiplied by nmmb. But then we've simplified it over the years because size was always one. So you can pretty much ignore the size uh, argument here and just go with nmmb1 or multiply them with each other as you would with... Eh, okay, you get it. And then the, this user data pointer is that pointer that you set yourself with the curl opt write data option. It could be pointing to whatever you decide. Libcurl doesn't care about it. It doesn't actually even know what is, what's there. It just passes it on to your callback. You do whatever you want with it. Uh, Libcurl uh, won't care and it can't care. So um, here's, an, here's an example. So you set up a right callback. Here's, here's the, uh, the, the beginning part of this example. Here's, in this case, I have a struct memory starting out from the top. It's just my custom struct. I, I just want to, to manage a pointer and a size. This is the data I want to receive. And then I write the callback itself. I call it write underscore CB, CB for callback. You know, and then I make sure that it uses the right prototype, as I mentioned. You can just copy and paste from the man page. And in this, in my particular case, I make sure that I set that user pointer, the, the fourth argument, that's a pointer to such to one of those struct memories that I declared at the top here. So I just make sure that I have a memory, struct memory variable called mem that I get a pointer to in the fourth argument. I check the, the size of the data that I'm receiving. And then I realloc my memory that I'm keeping to store the data that I receive data into. So it's pretty inefficient, but this reallocs on every write then and expands the memory for every write. So it reallocs the allocated memory into the new size. That's the old size plus the new size plus one because it it adds a zero terminate uh, null terminate thing there. So. Um, Um, you reallocate, so I get a get bigger L um, memory segment to store data in, and then below the reallocation there, I copy the new data into that new allocated memory area. I increase the size of the currently allocated memory, and I, I put in a null terminating byte at the end, so that you can work with it as a C string properly. And of course, the, the setting up things that's the top and then here's the bottom thing just the int main as you can see i declare the struct memory chunk there i, I malloc of, of byte and uh, and i said the total size is now zero bytes set up everything i set up a url i i set the write function the, to the write callback there's a write data that's actually passing in the pointer to my struct and this example also actually set the user agent option. Uh, that's, of course, voluntary uh, in this example. Why not? It's called agent dash, uh, uh, not dash, uh, slash, agent slash 1.22. Uh, 
I have no idea why I picked that version. Uh, okay, and then perform the transfer. And of course, when this performs the transfer, it will uh, connect to the server, it will ask for a download, it will get the resource, and for every chunk of data that, that libcurl receives, it will call the callback. And you don't know how many times it will be called. It might be called one time, or 22 times, or 33. Or if there's a problem, never, and it will just return an error instead. So you can't assume, and you also don't know exactly how big chunks you will get. You might get very small chunks or very big chunks. There's actually a maximum size to the chunks that you can figure out. It's also documented, but either way, you shouldn't assume that you will get small, large, big, and you can even get them both small and large, right, intermittently. And if you repeat the transfers uh, many times, they might appear with different sizes every time because it depends on network conditions and uh, conditions in the server side and s this conditions on your network and conditions in your machine and so on. So don't assume uh, about that. <clears throat> so that's how you do a simple, that was a simple uh, blocking transfer, getting data into a single memory block in memory. We will get much more into many other options, but uh, before I go through more options and everything, I want to just go back to the fact that I mentioned that this is the easy interface. It does synchronous uh, file transfers, blocking one, so the entire thing, and then it returns. But we also have a more complicated way because in many times, many times you, you don't want to have that just one transfers in a blocking way because maybe you want to do other things at the same time maybe you want to do many transfers at the same time without having to um, fall back to doing many threads or whatever so then we have the multi interface it is a the multi handle is then a new handle another handle than the easy handle this multi handle is a handle to hold many easy handles it's a so the super handle. You can add many ESA handles. And as I, one ESA handle is for one transfer, right? So if you add more ESA handles, that's for more transfers. So you can add many, mo many transfers, many ESA handles to a multi handle. <clears throat> and when you have many transfers added to a multi handle, you can do all of those transfers in parallel, simultaneously and in a non-blocking manner. So basically you can have a single threaded application doing a lot of parallel transfers. And with the multi-handle, you can also uh, have have it wait for your own sockets or file descriptors or everything in parallel to the ones that libcurl is doing. So you can pretty much do a lot of different things at the same time without using threads. And of course you can add transfers and remove transfers at any point in time while the uh, transfers are going so you don't have to actually set up all of them at once first you can actually start with one transfer then add a second and a third and remove the first and add the fourth and remove the second blah 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 according to your needs and wishes of course and whatever you want to do <laughs> and you do this by creating a multi-handle so curl multi in it in the same fashion uh, you recognize the pattern here it's, it's, it looks very similar to how to create an easy handle you just create a multi-handle uh, curl multi init returns a new multi handle. The multi handle, of course, is just a handle, and then you add. Easy, I want to add easy handles to this multi handle. Then you add them with curl multi add handle. Uh, <coughs> of course, however many transfers you want, maybe one, maybe three, or something like that. And when you've you're, you've done your entire transfer thing, and and you're done, you clean up. Yeah, oh sorry, you can remove ESA handles again, of course, maybe when the transfer is done, maybe before it was done, because you just, eh, let's give up. And when you're uh, done, you do a cleanup, but okay, uh, that wasn't mentioned there. So so basically you add a bunch of ESA handles to your multi-handle, so you can do a lot of them in parallel. So you, um, <clears throat> when you want to drive them, let's do a, all my transfers, you drive them with this function. So, Similar to the curl easy perform, there's a curl multi perform that then performs transfer for a multi handle. Transfers, really, or any, could be one, could be many. And this is, this is a little bit different than the easy one because this will only drive them as far as it can without blocking. 
So in this case, it will, you know, uh, do a, a s small amount of work and then return because if it couldn't do anything more without blocking, so uh, then it returns. So then the applica your application then waits until there is more work to do, and there's helper functions that lets your application know when there is more work to do. The easiest one is curl multipole. Basically, wait until libcurl has something to do. Basically, if there's an uh, incoming activity on a socket that libcurl is using, then we can continue. If there's no traffic, nothing happens, we can just wait. Um, curl multipole can then also wait for your application's file descriptors or sockets and so on, or you can do something else. And, um, and then you can also check if there's any activity, I mean, if any of the transfers are done, right? If you set up, a, I'm going to do 200 transfers, you want to know when one of those transfers uh, are complete, and you check that with this function, curl multi info read. Uh, and then you can move on, and if there uh, are, if while there are sort of, if there's still transfers going, I mean, you did a perform, you waited for something to happen, if something happened, or maybe you check if or, or have any transfers completed, but there might still be transfers ongoing, then you just continue that that journey. <clears throat> so this can go on forever, right? So so if you if when whenever whenever a transfer is done, you remove it from the multi-handle, but you can always add a new transfer, right? So you could basically just keep adding transfers. You don't ever have to end the curl multi-perform loop. Could just uh, well, as long as it has transfers to perform, it will perform them, or or whatever you're done, you're done. So this is up to you and your logic here for for your application. In the multi-internals. Um, Right, I just wanted to mention that the the easy interface I mentioned before is actually just a wrapper around the multi-interface. So actually everything internally is in a multi-interface. Um, <coughs> the, the good part of, about that is when you write, when you ever contribute any code to libcurl, uh, everything is actually treated as multi in, internally. So you can think of everything as non-blocking multi-interface internally. Um, <coughs> So uh, uh, I wanted to, I, I mentioned that the, I, we have this function. So since multi, uh, sorry, curl multi-perform drives a lot of parallel transfers, right? It might be say 22 transfers in parallel and curl multi-perform drives them all. So uh, it can't return any information about a single, I mean, if curl multi-perform runs, right, and you can, it can't return information about individual transfers because there are 22 transfers. That's why we have curl multi-info read. It basically gets uh, a queue with information about individual transfers. So if you call that, and it's a really fast uh, call in case nothing happens, it just basically just pulls a queue. So it, if there's if any transfer has completed, it will return info about that completed transfer. So, oh, transfer 17 has ended. It ended with return code zero. Everything was fine. And then, you know, so continue. And the next time you might call that function, it says, oh, well, and the next, uh, uh, you know, and you just call this function multiple times and it will return uh, information about transfers that have completed or no if nothing has completed so that's basically how you do and and uh, for what every completed transfers transfer you get the handle to that is a handle to that transfer and then uh, return code for that particular transfer so you know exactly which transfer ended how did it end and the curl multi info read function returns a, a pointer to a struct that looks like this uh, that I'm showing you here on the slide. Basically, it's, it returns a message that says, because it originally I had in, I anticipated that it could return a different, a number of different messages. Uh, <laughs> so and ex there's actually on, still only one message uh, type that can be returned and that is transfer completed one. And then it returns an easy handle and it returns a result. 
So, and when you're done, when you've done all your 22 transfers and you don't want to do any more, uh, or maybe you added three more and then 25 are completed, then you're done and you don't want to do any more transfers, you can call curl multi cleanup. Multi that's of course then it kills the multi handle and free all related resources. You're supposed to remove all the easy handles from it first so that you, you know, you do the same thing in, but in the reverse order. So if you added easy handles before, you remove them and then you clean it everything up because multi cleanup it doesn't clean sort of it doesn't free the the easy handles so you have to also do the curl easy cleanup per easy handle as i mentioned before so i i talk a lot about using apis and i understand that talking about it is not the same thing as showing and, and showing code so here's an example first we said this is an a little example it's it's going to do two parallel transfers they're both HTTPS for some reason. They could be different protocols because the API is used exact same way and no matter which protocol. I mean, one of them could have been FTP or IMAP. Uh, it doesn't matter for, for the example, really. But it creates, you can see here, two easy handles, easy and easy two. And then it sets uh, the URL for both of them, for, for first for the easy one and then for the easy two one. First is uh, HTTPS colon slash slash example.com and the other one is https colon slash slash curl.se uh, so it has two easy handles with options set and then it creates the multi handle it returns in a, in a variable called multi and it adds the two easy handles to the multi handle with the curl multi add handle right i'm going to do the transfer uh, i'm going to transfer those two transfers using and then we do the actual transfer starting from the top here uh, while there's still transfers going call multi perform and as you can see it at the second argument to the curl multi perform function there's a pointer to the still variable it will, act it will actually return the number of transfers that are still active still alive still ongoing so you that's that's why the next line is a condition there if there are still uh, transfers ongoing then wait for a while for something to happen so that we can continue uh, later. I mean, continue when something happens. Maybe there's incoming data on a socket or maybe it reaches a timeout. And the thousand there, that is the fourth argument to curl multiple, is just a timeout or timeout in 1000 milliseconds and then we loop anyway. Um, basically, you can do that to have a progress meter or do something else periodic periodically. And then later here, we check the curl multi info read, which then checks the queue. Did anything happen for any transfer? And it will return an information about uh, when the curl message done is set, a transfer has completed. Uh, and in this case, I uh, look at that. Am I the, it's a little bit broken there because the last line is hard to read. Anyway, so this then loops, so it goes back. So as long as there are living or active transfers, this will continue to loop. So it, it will stop the loop when all the transfers have completed. And there's no more ongoing ones, which in this example are two uh, transfers. So when both are completed, the loop ends. And then we tear down anything. We remove these handles again from the multi-handle. We clear up the multi-handle with curl multi-cleanup and we clean up the ESA handles, bam, bam, and then we're done. So then we did two transfers in parallel. Both of them, of course, very basic here because both of them sent everything to standard out. So everything will be mixed from both sources, possibly. So not an ideal uh, application here, but uh, small and simple. And uh, I think you get the gist of it. <clears throat> and I mentioned it already before, but there are a lot of caches involved in curl so caches in ways to store data to make it uh, faster when we <laughs> do things again or uh, and and when we use the easy handle and easy interface as we do curl easy perform with an easy handle all of these caches are kept and stored associated with the easy handle so as you can see the, the the little buckets I show you at the bottom of the slide here. The DNS cache, that's how you store names uh, to IP addresses, right? Uh, that's a cache. So it'll when it have, when it wants to look up the same name again within a short period of time, it can just use the same IP as it just 
uh, got uh, seconds ago. There's a connection pool. I'll talk you about talk about that in a few seconds. So it keeps connections alive a little bit after it has used them. So make sure that if you use the same host name again, it can go much faster. There's a session ID cache which makes it makes curl do faster TLS handshakes in subsequent connections to the same host again. And uh, it also stores the CA store in memory to make sure that it doesn't have to reparse it if you use it again within a certain amount of time. And so on. Uh, and there's cookies, old service data and HTTPS data. They are shown in red here because they are per single handle, even when you add them to the multi handle. Because mostly the green ones on the left side, those caches are kept in the multi handle. Automatic, so they are automatically shared between all the parallel transfers if you do parallel transfers by default. To, to complicate things even further, um, as if you needed it. There's also this curl multi socket action, which is a, is a sort of a variation of the curl multi interface. You know, how to do drive a lot of transfers in parallel, because this is how to drive a lot of transfers in parallel, the event based uh, version. And event based pretty much means that eh, you trigger it, you trigger events. Uh, based on changes on the socket situation, right? And usually this is, you drive this with an event-based uh, library or system. And this is really the way you want to do, if you if you go, uh, let's say you do an application and if you go beyond and above, like say a few hundred transfers, because then you really need to think about, because using select or poll, the normal wait for a lot of things happening uh, in curl, um that that's uh, that's th th those solutions turn really slow once you go beyond a certain amount of transfers or sockets um i mean you don't see the sockets but curl uses them so if you go if you do like a few hundred transfers in parallel with normal curl easy curl multi perform you will see that they might not be as fast as they can be then you want to go to the curl multi socket action because it's much better to deal with a huge amount of parallel transfers. And if you do, if you go with this, the basically, the, usually then you have a, a event library, like lib event or lib ev or lib uv. There are several different event libraries. Uh, some of them are, they usually tend to be a little bit different on different platforms. Uh, but anyway, when you use one of those event libraries, that's usually um, you interface with them and you say, I have this socket and I want to wait for that activity on that socket. And when you use this libcurl API, libcurl will tell you what sockets to wait for and what activity to wait for on that socket. And it will tell you about what kind of timeout timer that we want to expire and I mean, at what time it should expire. And then you should tell libcurl about it. So basically, you use that event library and you ask libcurl to tell you about sockets and timeouts and when those sockets get activity or the timeouts expire you tell libcurl about it with curl multi socket action that's basically how you do it and that's how it scales really well up to uh, well I've, I've had users done up to 40 50 thousands of parallel uh, transfers using this takes a little bit of tweaking to do that on a normal s system but it's possible and I'm not going to get into a lot of detail exactly how to use this because it's a f doing event based programming is more complicated than normal linear sort of programming and it's uh, harder to get everything right and I'm not uh, this is not the time for me to get into all of those details but read up about it there are examples and if you know event based you see how this maps to your event library um it's really cool okay we're we're getting somewhere it says out of 88 slides i'm not sure there actually are 88 but maybe they are if and if they are we are 20 slides off and we're uh, half an hour left roughly uh, i don't think i'm going to make it within two hours but okay <coughs> so i showed you some basics of how to do basic easy transfers and basic multi-transfers and I'm going to 
sort of that's how you do the basic transfers and now I'm going to go back and, and go into uh, more details about how to tweak things about the tr particular transfers and we're just going to start about how to set up things when you want to do uh, applications doing trans uh, libcurl transfers for example you want to make sure that you get verbose information and verbose information you can get in many several ways when you work with curl libcurl for example you want to make sure that you set this option this is an option that tells libcurl here's a buffer to write errors into if you run into any <laughs> which is you know I, I showed you how it always returns an error code so you know you're sure it's returned 27 when something bad happened and then you can figure out what error 27 means because it's documented and you, there's a function that can convert it for you but sometimes libcurl can actually tell you about more details about exactly the situation that happened when you got return code 27 and the only way for you to get those details might be to to provide that error buffer buffer because then libcurl can provide you more information more detailed information about that particular reason why you got 27 in this particular instance so you you really want to do this at least for development and, and figuring things out and this the, the curl up verbose is really key to understanding what curl is doing so if you set this one to one you enable it you get a lot of verbose uh, information sent to standard error um, about what curl is doing thinking sending and receiving to help you understand what's going on and again in particular when when things are not working the way you think they should setting this is a perfect way to get a lot of more data for you to under oh now i see this is what's happening maybe i should tweak this and that and you basically just do this um, in this example uh, as you can see it starts out with an easy init and then it has a buffer with a curl error size size and it needs to be at least this big the, the error buffers you provide to curl and then you provide the buffer to curl with the curl opt error buffer you set the verbose level with curl opt verbose or, or you enable verbose you set it to one it has to be one there's well you can switch off with zero there are no other values that are supported for anything the other ones are undefined so uh, maybe they will be used for something in the future and it sets the URL so this then makes the transfer uh, with verbose enabled and it has passed on a buffer for errors in case there's an error and I'm showing you in this case this little code here then says if a error is returned check if if it got data in the error buffer then uh, uh, output that and if no error was provided in the error buffer show the the reason for the error code that curl easy str error um, contains for it the uh, the, the 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 line there that says curl opt verbose you, you can see that this says one and a capital l and that's just c style for that capital l means that's long type so I could also just type cast it as a long with you know parenthesis long parenthesis um, so just um, this th that goes back to the, the thing that the compiler doesn't really know what kind of type that it's supposed to pass in there so if you don't explicitly say that it's a long the compiler might think it's an int and that's wrong here because it's supposed to be a long so that's why we enforce it as a long with the at uh, sorry <laughs> with the one and a capital l you you will see this in a lot of examples and code i try to i try to emphasize this on on all my examples maybe i've got it sometimes but you will see it also so and another way to help you out with if if um, the error buffer and verbose is not enough for you then there's this extra uh, option called debug function it's pretty much a way to instead of sending everything to standard error because that's might be inconvenient for you send it all to a function that you provide um, and there's also this uh, recent addition to the family called curl global trace it says i want to get extra information about these particular details that's happening inside curl and i'll show you you can also get information and in particular within the debug functions about what 
what transfer is happening and what connection is it re in relate does it relate to so whatever the information you get in the debug function it could be related to a particular transfer or a particular connection and it works like this in, in this case it's a debug function callback so it, it's called by curl when it wants to deliver the debug, debug information uh, you know that's probably quite often and as you can see at the top here it's it's a prototype for a handling it it's a callback that will get called you know a curl handle in the info type and data and the size and the user pointer and it can do whatever it wants with the with the information right and it in this case it doesn't actually do anything it just i just showed you the skeleton of how it could be started uh, <clears throat> there's actually a pretty good example on the curl site that you can get i think it's called just debug.c that is actually shows a complete example with with the details and blurting things out in a in a hex output style if you want to and uh, and then and then you have to show here the setups later than the, the the bottom half of this example you can see that it sets the debug function and it sets the debug data and again the debug data then as a reminder passes on the pointer that becomes the user pointer in the callback so point it, in this case it provides a pointer to the config struct that so that it provides that pointer into the callback and again the verbose it has this one capital l thing to make sure that it's long set to one to enable verbose Bam. and you get more information um, sent to your application maybe you want to store it in a log maybe you just want to have it keep it around in case you have problems or whatever the, the debug function also gets all incoming and outcoming data so it can actually log and keep track of everything very very detailed and in this case uh, also here's how it uses the global trace config thing it says oh i want to get all the details about all protocols that it can possibly provide data for and this will get you even more data into the debug callback you should read up about uh, read the demand page for curl global trace because you can select you can have, i just want the http2 details or just the http3 details or just the tls details there's there's uh, ways to configure exactly that and again you probably want to enable the name disable that exactly for what you want to debug maybe not go with all at least when you go with all you might get a lot of data and as i mentioned you can also extract the transfer and the connection id pretty much i guess that's the way for you if you get a lot of different debug information to correlate which of the different i mean how do they belong to each other so you know that it's the same connection same transfer then you know it's related because if you do hundreds and hundreds of parallel transfers you might get quite a lot of the bag the bug information that could be you know for different transfers different connections it might be difficult to correlate them with each other sometimes unless you ask libcurl for, for details about it there's also a way for you to figure out which libcurl version you're using and and by then also going with that what kind of stuff that par your particular libcurl version that you run right now what does it support what version is it what protocols does it support what features does it support and i'm just wanted to show you that in this little uh, thing here um so uh, in this case uh, it shows um, an example here then that calls in first global init and then it calls and it shows the curl version curl version is a simple function just returns a pointer to the version string not very practical and then it has the curl version info that returns a pointer to a struct with a lot of data about curl and in this little example if you run it it'll show this output and in this output i just highlighted every other line to make it slightly easier to show but this is if you compile the example on the right and run it you will get the output as i show you on the left uh, <clears throat> so as you can see it gets information about the curl version there libcurl and all its particular components and versions of those uh, the version number and you can get the version number in a numerical way and you can extract the parts of it you get all the features as named features and you get all the protocols as named protocols they're actually 
URI schemes that are support for, for URLs. So, and you get can actually get quite a lot more information. You get a lot more detailed information from that struct. So whatever you want to know about the a particular libcurl you run right now, the binary thing you actually your application is using, this is the function for you. And to help you write your applications and know what you can use when, right? It's car as I said, 252 releases of curl. Maybe 200 of them have been different uh, libcurl versions. I haven't really counted, but there's a lot of new things added over time, right? So how do you know when you can add use what in what version? Um, then we provide this fancy table called symbols in versions and uh, it exists on this url that i show you here on the screen and it basically looks like this the symbol on the left when was it added to libcurl that's the version number and when from when one is deprecated and actually uh, in some rare uh, instances in which was the ver last version that supported this thing um, and you can see that we that's i think we the list contains now right 12 1400 symbols or something so it's a lot of them so if if you're ever curious can is this sim particular symbol supported in in this particular version you can check it out um. <clears throat> right and so when you do a transfer a significant part or important part of doing a uh, transfer is of, of course connecting to that server you're going to do the transfer with right so then you need to resolve your host name to an I to a set of ip addresses you d you want to do happy eyeballs uh, happy eyeballs being connecting to both the ipv4 version and the ipv6 version at the same time and getting with the one picking the one that completes first and you want to select maybe I just want to pick one of those IP versions uh, and or maybe not the other or whatever and at the same, same time Carl will help you to do persistent connections so that it will keep using the same connection when you even when you do repeated transfers and basically it works like this and I, I alluded to that before when I talked about the connection pool that you have a client that want to talk first you want to talk to maybe example.com you know, set up a connection there and afterwards when it, when it has completed that transfer it will store that in the connection pool and remember i have a connection to https colon slash slash example dot com port 443 keep it there and then we set up another connection right to maybe curl.se we do a separate uh, second connection oh that's a separate connection it, it will do the transfer to curl.se everything works and then when that is complete it stores that one as well both of them are now live connection stored in the connection pool so they they are still alive and well and then when the client wants to do a third transfer and this time back to the same host that it started with example.com you want to do that it and it finds that it actually has it in the pool it will pick it up from the pool instead of creating a new one so just reuse that it's in the pool we don't have to set it up again we can just reuse it and number three can then can then reuse the connection that it has already in the pool and that's uh, the really the key to do really fast subsequent transfers so if you you know you have a loop and you want to do 200 transfers to your same host name It'll, it'll automatically then reuse the same connection as long as it can, as long as the server allows it, as, as long as everything works, it'll just keep reusing the same connection thanks to this connection pool, sometimes called the connection cache. And, and that's really cool. And they are stored there if they are still alive, right? So if they're not alive, if someone closed them or if someone told, told us to close them, they won't be stored there, there right? And it has a, a, a finite number of entries basically you s you can set the number curl opt max connects so it's fairly low uh, generally to begin with because it's typically you don't want to have them there for a very long time anyway because they're less likely to actually work if they stick around there for a long time so maybe you don't need more than a few they're also only kept around for a, a certain amount of seconds called curl up max h con so you can that's uh, set to 118 by default so basically after two minutes they won't be reused anymore because the likeliness that they will still work is so low so 
basically it's not practical but you can raise the limit if you think that's uh, good for you um <clears throat> so i uh, right i wanted to also just emphasize that the connection reuse is done per name then not per ip address so if you want to if you do a connection to example.com example.com will of course be resolved to the set of ip addresses and connected to an ip address when you do the connection but when it's stored in the connection pool it is remembered by name so when you do a second connection to con example.com it will be reused and then the the second connection will just then of course use the same ip as the previous connection because that connection is still there but it won't resolve the host name the second time because it, that would just be slow and, and take a long time so it sort of skips the resolving part when it can reuse the connection no no point in resolving the name then just go with the existing connection and this works for all supported protocols as long as the protocol itself can do uh, persistent connections like this and of course exactly figuring out which connection you can reuse and cannot reuse is a bit of a tricky thing so it has a number of conditions and extra requirements so sometimes you will see that it won't reuse a connection that you thought that it might could do might be otherwise but it's slightly difficult the logical thing there you can say that this new connect this new transfer that i'm doing don't try to reuse an old connection by setting this option fresh connect maybe you have a, a reason for doing that maybe you know something that you know nah, i want this to be a new one you can actually also say this particular transfer that i'm doing this connection should not be reused after this con uh, transfer is done so forcibly close this afterwards which also again you might know something that we don't but it's really bad idea typically because it makes it for much worse performance if you do this and of course there's this tricky other little thing that you might want to do you might want to add keep alive because that's a tcp feature that just makes the tcp connection do some extra ping pong talks so that it is likely to keep the connection better alive uh, it won't be idle for very long then <coughs> so pretty much when you set up a connection you can also uh, watch what's fun is this you can do fun name tricks for example you can pre-populate the dns cache by providing a name to an ip address lookup in this case for example here uh, this little example here it provides first example.com on port 443 it should resolve to this uh, ip address 127.001 than being localhost and it also <coughs> provides another lookup for the www.example uh, port 443 to again to the same ip address basically it it allows curl to sort of uh, you you pre-populate the dns cache so when you used uh, as this example uses the example.com hostname it will find that we have already populated the dns cache so it won't resolve the hostname using normal means but it will find our sort of quote unquote fake entry and use that instead <coughs> And that's just a way for you for example to convenient way to to work out when you have a um, experimental thing in your lab or development thing and you want to use real uh, url but you don't want it to connect to the real server so you can redirect it somewhere else then that's is a fancy way to do that and you can also instead of redirecting from a host name to a particular ip address you can also internally rewrite one hostname port number to another hostname port number so in this case for example uh, this redirects your curl.se port 443 to example.com port 443 so instead of connecting to even though the url says curl.se it will internally change that name to example.com resolve that and connect to that server instead again fancy if you want to do your experimental development things or or redirect whatever maybe yes it's up to you it's it's really convenient sometimes if you want to go to in this case for, for example if you have a number of servers being load balancers for a single site and you want to go to one particular of those sites so maybe you want to go to one dedicated host name and still use the generic one in the url maybe just be aware that when you're connecting to the wrong host sometimes you will have a problem with the the name in the tls certificate when you verify uh, that's uh, that's why this example disables the uh, the ssl verify host option here because maybe 
otherwise you will get a, a certificate error or maybe not it depends on your situation i really cannot tell but uh, um, might be important to just remember that and keep that in mind <clears throat> But and, and if you do fun things, if you use CARES as a backend uh, for name resolving, which typically people don't, so but some do. And if you do that, you have more options to also uh, play around with the name resolving part, but th because then your name to IP uh, thing, you can set things like a dedicated DNS server for your particular transfer. So instead of using the default uh, uh, name servers, you said, here are my name servers to use for this particular transfer pretty fancy but of course it it requires you to know this and, and uh, it's a niche setup and it requires your libcurl to be built with CARES but still cool okay and um, why not in, in a modern uh, computer today you have a lot of different network interfaces maybe you have them connected to different in, uh, networks uh, different setups somehow and sometimes you want to select that to go your traffic should use one particular network interface and not one of the others and then you can tell libcurl to use i want to use this particular network interface with the curl opt interface option easily specified like this it's a string so you just curl opt interface and the name of the interface and this is a interface name on your machine that you're using right now in my case, this ENP3S0 is actually an interface name on my local development machine. It, the names will be different on your machines. The, they have to actually exist and they have to actually work. If you... Uh, one second, I think they're a little bit loud here in my background. Uh, wait. There. Okay. <clears throat> I was talking about the network interface, right? So, and, and in this case, you, you set um, the network interface name as a string. You can actually also provide it as a host name and an IP address. Yeah. But then you have to, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit complicated because it still has to be the, ne the it has to end up the IP address of one of the interfaces that you have, right? You cannot just invent an IP address to use as a source address. It has to actually be uh, the IP address of a network interface that you are using. So you can provide it as an IP address if you want to. Um, <coughs> a little bit complicated, but it it's useful <coughs> when you need it. Another niche thing is that you can instead of then just binding your uh, your local end to a particular ip address you can tell you can ask libcurl to <coughs> to use a particular local port number or local port number range <coughs> i think this in 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 the past i've, I've heard about people mostly using this for example when you have a maybe you have a firewall that restricts so all your outgoing connections has to use your local ports within a particular port range otherwise we know that it's a malicious thing so we will not allow it and something like that <coughs> but anyway we curl then uh, has these uh, options to um, set the local port and the local port range basically try in in this example try port to 20,000 and try all the other port numbers uh, up to 10 numbers following because you know it's a finite resource right S maybe someone else is already using port 20,000 then we can't use it so then we tr can try the next one and the next one and in this case try 10 different ports until it fails uh, it is of course more risky that you will get a failure because uh, trying to use a specific dedicated local port is uh, going to fail more times than not limiting uh, your connection to a particular port range and i got the question here if the, the i mentioned the the um, interfaces the network interfaces of course you can use n virtual network interfaces too you can use whatever network interface as long as it's a network interface in the eyes of the tcp stack 
um, this one going back here to the network interface so the network interface is actually what is provided for the tcp stack so it, a virtual network interface is also a network interface to the tcp stack so it doesn't matter if it's physical real i mean it's to t the tcp stack and the curl they're all just interfaces so they will work local port ranges fun and as i mentioned before then tcp keep alive it's a w it's a way to you know when you set up a tcp connection between you and some other site um, a tcp connection doesn't have any traffic uh, nothing happens over the network if nothing is transferred pretty much you know there's uh, <laughs> if you're done with your transfer or if the transfer is real you know slow and hold up for some reason and nothing is being transferred then it's really nothing happening so it's uh, it can then be completely silent over long periods of time if things or conditions are the and having completely silent co connections it that leads to things like them being disconnect or um five walls and servers and then we'll disconnect s things but oh, nothing is being ha happening here we'll we'll just kill it and the the good part of a tcp connection being possible uh, i mean having the possibility of being completely silent is that you can actually a completely silent tcp connection you can actually you know rip the cable out and put it back and nobody will know because there was no traffic there so no one knew that it was actually disconnected for a while because there was no reason to know that but that also means that sure if if it gets disconnected you won't know that it gets disconnected until you actually want to send traffic over it so that's also a reason why you want to go with enable keep alive because it will then help you detect disconnects and stuff like that so usually maybe uh, having a keep alive i mean for many situations you want it because it helps you detect things better in some other uh, situations you don't want it so yeah, yeah, yeah what's what do you want anyway curl supports a tcp you to so set tcp keep alive so then curl will use tcp keep alive on the connections that it creates and basically you can then set different uh, interval timers for when to send the keep alive and so on <coughs> as i showed you here on this example this actually has one option that is a boolean that says on off and then it has two other uh, pretty much how long to wait until it's considered idle when to start sending them and then how many how the interval between sending those probes <coughs> and if that's not enough sometimes um you know there you're sometimes they say that ipv6 is a new thing we should use <laughs> i'm kidding it's been around for for uh, for pretty much uh, i think longer than curl has but uh, still, you know, IPv4 is maybe the dominant IP protocol version. But, you know, they both exist. They are both used. And maybe you want to use one or the other. Curl will, by default, try to use both. And it will happily use both. And it will try to use both. As long as your local end supports it, the server supports it, it will try both. And it, as I mentioned before, it uses the happy eyeballs approach. Happy eyeballs means that it first starts a connect attempt with one of the protocols and then it starts a second just slightly behind so they go both in parallel and the one that completes first will be used and the other one will be thrown away and typically we start the ipv6 one slightly before the ipv4 one so if both are supported it should prioritize the ipv6 one but if the ipv6 one fails or is slow for some reason it will go with the ipv4 one and also if then if the IPv6 doesn't work for some reason, it will also go with IPv4 one. And you can change then if you don't want to do the happy eyeballs. If you want to go with one of them, you can just uh, tell curl to use the one I know like this. And in this uh, using the, the curl opt IP resolve option, say I want to I wanted to use V6 only then it'll try to do the connection using ipv6 only and it will fail if it can't use ipv6 maybe you want that maybe you don't want that uh, you can use it and getting to the end of the part one i, w I w wanted to mention then of course that authentication is a pretty big part when it comes to transfers in general authentication being you have some kind of credentials showing that you're you you are allowed to access the resource you want to 
get or, or put. And most of the protocols curl supports offer authentication in one way or another. And many of them have more than one type. So basically you can select different types of authentication. And this is a really big topic and I'm not going to explain a lot of details about it because it's a very, it's not a niche thing, but it's so such a wide topic. So, so whoever you are, I'm probably not going to be able to cover your particular needs. So if you want to read up and you want to use more authentication, read up on these options because you, typically authentication involves setting a username and a password by default at least. And typically curl has a default method that it does authentication. If you set username and password and you use a URL, it will use authentication and, and will try to use the correct authentication, but maybe you need some other options to tell which kind of authentication to use. Sometimes you need something more as well. If you talk with a proxy, it has an own set of additional options. So you can use authentication with the remote server and you can use authentication with your proxy and they are independent, right? So you could, that's a double set of options. And the proxy then can also use different methods because, eh, so it could end up a lot of different options and combinations. And to make matters slightly worse, maybe for HTTP, there's, I mean, we are all used to logging into things and, and providing username and password to things on the web, right? But many times these days, that's not used with HTTP authentication on the protocol level HTTP. Uh, it's usually these days done by an HTTP post and keeping state in a cookie. Um, so that's not actually authentication in a protocol level, but it's authentication on a application level. So uh, for for the cookie adventures, um, we're going to get into that deeply in, in part two. Uh, so I will save that for Monday. Um, but if you just wanted to see the basic stuff, how to access a resource providing your credentials like on curl.se if it would be uh, authentication. I mean, if we'd been required credential, you would set it like this username and password, Clark and Kent, and it would just magically use that. Um, in in this case, when you use HTTP, the default method would be basic. It's called basic. It's a pretty naive implementation of to do it, but yeah. That's how, how, how you provide default uh, way to do authentication, authenticated transfers. And with this, um, you can also then provide authenticated authentication information in a file called netrc. The .netrc is an ancient standard for providing username passwords for particular machines, originally done to help for FTP. It's, I, this, I think this particular file format has traces back to early 1970s. So it has actually existed for, yeah, over 50 years. It's a pretty weakly defined syntax, but libcurl support it. And you can provide credentials in this file like that. And you can, it's a default in home on, on a user, uh, not user, in a Unix system, it's a, a user's home directory. So in Linux, it's, it exists there. And if you wanna, tell libcurl to use it, you say, hey, I want to use the net dot <laughs> curl opt netrc, and you can tell it to have netrc optional, or you can actually call it, uh, make it mandatory as well. I don't remember exactly what the name is then. A and then you, you can provide a custom file name instead of using the default, here's a, a particular file to treat, consider to be a netrc file, and then access uh, whatever. And the netrc file then ideally then of course provides credentials for that particular host name you're accessing because a netrc file can provide cr credentials for a lot of different machines in a single file. It details name, password and machine. So it could be a huge amount of them. That, so that's a, a traditional way to provide authentication. But of course, if you provide name and password in a file, make sure that no one else than you can read it, or at least only the ones you know, or is supposed to be able to read it, can read it. So it's a bit of a sensitive thing, right? It's a, again, back to the question about password sec secured and everything, a complicated thing. 
Uh, right. And um, as I mentioned before, right, all the curl is interface functions. They return this variable type. It's a numerical thing, curl, curl code. And uh, we have the similar pattern for other APIs, the multi-interface return curl M code. The share interface that I haven't talked about today, I will talk about it uh, on Monday, it returns also the same thing in the URL interface. They all, you can see the pattern here. They're all type deft enums. So basically they return a number. Zero is okay. Non-zero is an error. They all have str error um, functions that can return a string that is an English explanatory phrase for that particular number. So you will, um, yeah, you can return. If you got that, I got a seven back, what, what, what does seven mean? Because the seven has a, a name in code, so you can use the name from the header file, but maybe you want to provide it to a user or in a log, and then you can convert it to a string using the str error functions. But again, zero is always success. Non-zero is an error, always for all these error codes. All the errors, of course, in detail are provided in the libcurl errors man page. As I mentioned, I think already, we have a lot of man pages. So read up in the man pages. If there's ever any doubt, read the man page. And with this, we have reached this point in the presentation, which is the intermission. So I am at two hours, nine minutes, something maybe two hours and five minutes. Uh, so with this, I uh, am happy to say that uh, you have uh, survived part one of the Mastering Libcurl uh, video. In the next part, there's going to be more getting into the details about more fun, on, fun stuff with transfers, more share API, URL API, header API, uh, um, and things going even beyond just doing transfers, but also managing the data uh, in different ways. <clears throat> so um, this recording will be made available after the fact. Um, I will make the slides available as well. And I will, uh, everything will be available to everyone. So if, in case you miss out, you don't find them, just get in contact with us and we make sure that you get the links to everything, all the data. Um, and again, on Monday, the same time as I did today, I will start part two, roughly the same length. Um, so uh, if there is anyone with any more questions, so fire them off right now. I don't see any questions uh, right now, so I think I'm good. Um.